Ladies and gentlemen, hello everybody. My name is Hans Roland Dürr from the University of Munich. We are orthopedic oncology inside our department of orthopedics, physical medicine and rehabilitation. I would like to talk to you um, about a very rare disease, the so-called pigmented vinonotular synovitis, or you may have heard the name, the official name, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. We don't like this word giant cell tumor because many patients uh, look up at Google or whatever and they find the giant cell tumor of a bone. And the giant cell tumor of a bone has really nothing to do with a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. So we like to speak from pigmented vinyl nodular cellulitis, even if it is not the official name. Uh, who are we and where are we? We are in Germany, in the south of Germany, in Bavaria, in Munich, with this uh, city of about 1.3 million inhabitants and our hospital is one of the largest in the Federal Republic of Germany, you see it here. Um, we have about 1,300 beds and about four to 600 doctors. We have um, center of bone and soft tissue tumors and uh, we as orthopedic oncology are part, just a small part of this center. So in general we do about 800 surgeries per year in patients with bone and soft tissue tumors. In patients with uh, PDS we do about 60, 50 to 60 a year and this is really a lot if you count for the rareness of the disease. In the last years, the number of publications regarding BVS has increased because uh, we now have the possibilities or the first result of systemic therapies with antibodies. And that caused a lot of uh, pharmaceutical corporations to go into a business to do more research and to uh, also to uh, create uh, new drugs used for the PVS and that is uh, resembled by the number of uh, publications going up in the last 10 to 15 years. What is the PVS? The PVS is a disease going, uh, coming from the inside of a joint, from a uh, synovial tissue in the joint or from the synovial tissue around tendons or in bursae. Uh, you sometimes have bursae, for example, at the hip and inside those bursae you also find tenosynovial tissue and you may develop there a uh, PVS. PVS is an, uh, sometimes inflammatory looking, it's not inflammatory, it's an inflammatory looking disease which broadens the layer of the synovia in the joint, which creates, as you see it here on the right side, villonodular lesions, uh, brown or green in the aspect, and if it grows on, it may destruct the joint. The destruction begins normally at the rim of the cartilage to the bone, or where uh, tendons or uh, ligaments go inside the bone or attached to the bone. From there, sometimes the lesion grows into the bone and creates cystic uh, lesions. You see it on the left side in an MRI that inside those lesions you always have islands that are looking dark in that sequence of the MRI, also in other sequences. And that is because in those islands or in the tissue of the PVS, there is uh, iron, iron ions, and those iron ions, they make the pigmentation, and they are also uh, in, in charge for the dark aspect in MRI. So it's a very, very typical diagnosis is in MRI. If you have seen some patients with PBS in the MRI, you never will forget that. Before the 40s of the last centuries, a lot of names had been given to that disease because no one knows what is causing the disease. And in diseases with no cause, uh, 
you always have a number of names because everyone think the uh, originating cell or the originating tissue is something he knows and when he gives the name of the tissue to a lesion and at the end it's all different. So lesions with a lot of names are lesions from which in fact nobody knows where they come from. We have two forms. One is the localized PBS, it's just a nodule. It may enlarge, may be really big, but it's just one nodule. This is the most easiest form. And we have a diffuse form, and this is a synovitis going through all the joint over a longer aspect of the tendons. And this, this is the most difficult disease you have in PBS with diffuse forms. Um, we speak from an articular PBS, a PBS inside a joint, two-thirds, 60% to two-thirds are normally localized at the knee joint, but you can find it in every, in every joint, what, what you ever have in your body. I, I saw PBS also in the small joints of the spine, you find it in the fingers, you find it in the toes, you find it all over the body. And you have the extra articular disease, that is the disease coming from the tendon sheaths or from the borsa. Those extra articular diseases are in many cases easier to treat because they are more localized, but not in all cases. Think of a foot with its thousands of tendons. There is a, a malignant giant cell tumor. Oh, uh, that is a wrong spelling. Giant cell tumor of tendon sheaf. At least it is called malignant. In fact, we don't think there is something like a malignant giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. The problem is that we have extremely rare, uh, but sometimes we have a patient who has a disease that looks like a PVS but behaves malignant. And one explanation is that it is in fact not a PVS. It is some sort of a sarcoma which has large areas who, which look like a PBS, but the lesion itself is a sarcoma. Or the second explanation is that it is a, a truly malignant tumor inside the PBS or a recurrent PBS. We think that the first explanation, a truly malignant sarcoma, which looks like a PBS, is the, the real thing, but we are not sure about that. In fact, you know, PBS is very rare, and the malignant form of PVS is extremely rare. Um, in, or from the epidemiology, we have about 1.8 cases per million inhabitants per year. So Germany has uh, roughly 83, 84 million inhabitants. So if you say two cases per year, you have 160 to 170 cases per year in Germany. That is really Nothing. It's a very rare disease that causes the situation that a lot of orthopedic surgeons are not experienced with the disease. Even radiologists uh, looking on the MRIs are not experienced and so we have sometimes patients who have a long, long history of investigations till someone made the right diagnosis. The female to male ratio is uh, in literature two to one, two times as much females as males. In our own patient, it's about 50 50, 47 to 58 in one of our last studies. So I'm not quite sure whether two to one is the correct one, but the large studies, if you see the Dutch study, including over a thousand patients from all over the world, they also found two to one. So maybe we have a bias in the recruiting patients in Munich. In general, there's just one location of the disease. I have only one patient who has multiple locations and he has a syndroma, a very rare syndroma. In that syndroma, PVS is only part of his diagnosis, the least important one. But he has PVS in uh, at least three joints. The mean age group or the main age group is uh, between the third and fourth decade of life. But we have the impression that we have two uh, peaks. One is in that age group and the other one is around 50, around 50 years plus minus. And I show it to you later. We also have a lot of patients in that age group. 
and the location is in 60% to two-thirds the knee, when the hip, the ankle or the foot in total, the phalangeal joints of the hand, the elbow or the shoulder, and all other joints or regions with, which do have a tenosynovial tissue. But most important is the knee. And the etiology is absolutely unknown. Nobody knows where it comes from. Um, we have a lot of names for that. The last uh, or the major theory in the last century was that it is an inflammatory disease or an inflammatory reaction. Chaffee published that in the 40s. At the moment we think it's a tumor. We have more hints for being a tumor in that lesion as a clonal anomalia and an autonomous growth of the lesion and the potential of spread. But uh, there are also studies that show that we have a polyclonality and in fact uh, show that it is not a tumor. So we aren't sure whether PBS as we know it at the moment is one block of disease. Maybe there are certain forms which resemble a tumor and other forms which resemble a reactive tissue. But we aren't sure about that. And as it is, at the moment, most of the uh, literature speaks in favor of a tumor of a neoplastic disease, not a tumor, tumor swelling of a neoplastic disease, a really growing, autonomous growing disease. Some patients ask us um, whether we have, after investigating their tissue, a chance to tell them whether they are at a high, a low, or intermediate risk for a recurrent disease. And there are some markers in the tissue as the KRAS, i uh, show it to you here, it's published last year, which might be used as a, for risk stratification. But if you do it, if you really have a look to it close, you see there is absolutely no prognostic effect of the KRAS. We have also popping up in the literature else and then other markers, but at the moment no marker was identified for uh, giving a prognosis on a molecular basis or on the basis of histology to the patients. The histology itself is uh, interesting because you have in the soft tissue a lot of giant cells. You see that cells with a many nuclei those are giant cells containing more than one, uh, sometimes very, very many nuclei. In the bone, those giant cells are osteoclasts. In the soft tissue, they are uh, a mandatory part of the lesion. And if you do a, a coloring or staining for the iron, for example, Berliner Blau reaction, then you see that in those soft tissue lesions there is a lot of iron deposits. And that is the typical aspect of a PBS. Clinically, the typical symptoms are a slowly growing swelling of the joint. We have patients who have growing swelling since more than 10 years. Many patients don't recognize the starting of a swelling. At some point it's there. But till that point, it has to grow over a considerable time. So they come and say, since a year, I felt that swelling. I'm not sure whether it's growing or not, but I felt it since a year. But if you look closer to the patients, or you have a chance to get former investigations, former MRIs, to see it's a very slowly growing disease uh, going over years in many cases. They sometimes, especially at the knee, have a feeling of foreign bodies because it's a, it's a nodule inside the joint and it does not cause pain normally. But you may have the impression that there is something that does not belong inside the joint. We have a local warming of the joint, you have sometimes restrictions of motion. And uh, at the knee, those symptoms may simulate a meniscal lesion. Meniscal lesions are very common. So if one of 10,000 meniscal lesions is a PVS, it's overseen. And the patients then get an arthroscopy and uh, the doctor says, oh, I found something that I hadn't expected in your joint. In general, he does a histology and then comes up with a diagnosis of PVS, 
that is very unusual for the patient and or for, for the doctor. The radiology or the radiographs of the patients normally show nothing. In some cases you see a calcification, but calcification in a soft tissue tumor is always uh, something that you have to look more carefully. This is rare. Normally you see nothing. You see if the disease goes on, an erosive cystic uh, lesion growing into the bone because it's growing very slowly, you see sclerotic bone rims, bony rims at the margins of the lesion. And this happens most often in diffuse forms. In localized forms you may sometimes see that the lesion invades or presses part of the body away. I will show it to you later. The most important imaging is the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, because there you can not only see the extension of the disease, but also the iron deposit. And with that information, it is iron in the lesion, and the typical aspect, the morphology, you can do the diagnosis. So the diagnosis is in front of histology, mainly done by the MRI. You have a hyper or iso intense signal in T1 and in T2 uh, uh, images. You have sometimes persistent lesions inside the tissue and you have a hypertense ring. If you think of a PVS, there is a differential diagnosis that is hematrosis. Think of hemophilic patients who sometimes have bleeding inside their joint. So they have the iron deposit in the joint and they have, because of the bleeding, a synovitis and they might get the wrong diagnosis of a PVS. Then there is a lesion called chondromatosis, that is a very, very different lesion which makes uh, not the same, but nearly the same images in MRI. So you can really miss the right diagnosis. A small cartilage bodies formed by the inside of a synovia, also with a synovitis, and that might look like a PVS in the eyes, as the radiologist would say, of an unexperienced radiologist. But sometimes it's really difficult to separate those lesions and in many cases we do an arthroscopy and a biopsy or whatever in front of the therapy, to be sure. When you have hemangiomas, that are hematomas, uh, you are born with them or they develop as a child, and when you see, or you see in those patients uh, sometimes large vessels, normally veins, inside the joint or inside the synovia. And because they are blood filled, they may look like a PVS and a lesion that's called lipoma aborescens that's also growing below nodular in the joint from the synovia but it's totally made of lipoplasts of fatty tissue and you may see it clear in MRI. Just a few examples on the left side that is lipoma aborescens. You see that digit like uh, extension of the lesions inside the joint. They grow like a tree for that the Latin word aborescence is, uh, uh, has been found. Lipoma, they are made of fatty tissue. When you have a hemangioma in the middle, you see the uh, transection of small vessels, small uh, or vessels with a very thin wall, veins, inside the knee joints. And this might also give the impression of a PVS. And on the right side, chondromatosis, this is a typical aspect also of PVS. If you see it in, in one image of the MRI, you have to look carefully for the other images and in many cases you won't be sure at the end what it is and you have to do a biopsy. The big advantage is that the treatment of chondromatosis and PVS regarding surgery is just the same, total synovectomy. You also have, uh, you already have seen that image in front with a large PBS, you see that it often extends at the knee joint in the dorsal part. Also in that patient, you see in the ventral part, on the left side, you see on the very left the patella, the kneecap. And between the kneecap and the bone of the femur, there is a, a synovitis. This is the, the, uh, uh, the tissue that is whitish on that MRI. That's whitish because that is contrast medium taken by the tissue. 
That's the synovitis, the very top one is uh, just joint fluid. And you see a massive extension of the synovitis in the ventral aspect of the knee, in the anterior aspect. That is easy to treat. To treat it, you need to open the knee joint and need to remove it. But in the frontal part or in the anterior part of the knee, there is nothing very serious what you can harm. So you have to be careful for the ligaments and for, for the cartilage, but it's normally it's not a too complicated surgery. You even may do it arthroscopically. So many, many surgeons treat the patients on the ventral side because they can do it easily. And the big problem is on the dorsal side. You see there the PVS goes inside all of the dorsal part of the joint. It invades the muscle, it invades the tissue around the most important vessels and the most important nerves there. So if you would like to resect it in total, a biosynovectomy, you have to uh, really to do a large preparation of the vessels and of the nerves and if you do it not every day uh, you might get into droplets with that because that is very sophisticated surgery as an uh, or in orthopedic oncology you will learn it and you will do it but if you do it for example in sports medicine your colleagues are not used to do such long incisions or to do such uh, large uh, dissections of the planes at the dorsal part of the popliteal. And arthroscopically, arthroscopically you can't do it. There's no chance to do it. You see the ventral part of the disease in the knee joint. You see on the left side the typically brown green aspect of that PBS uh, going throughout the anterior knee joint. The white thing is the cartilage of the femur and all around is the PVS. And you see it on the right side where it is removed, just in the middle where the cruciate ligaments are, is a remnant of that disease. And you have to really carefully remove every little tiny bit of that disease to get rid of it. And at the end, you have a, a cup of tissue filled uh, with uh, all of that PVS, and you have a knee joints which has a large trauma, you have a large wound in the joint because you have removed all that synovial membrane which is inside the joint. It's a large area you have treated. And uh, afterwards you have to be careful with those patients to avoid bleeding in the first days and to avoid cluing and afro uh, or a restriction of motion in the next days because all that wound uh, inside the knee will clue together if you don't do movement with that joint but if you move too much it may bleed so it's always uh, what we say in germany a way between sulla and charybdis to do much or to do less and the big problem is the dorsal side we do it in one surgery so we start on the ventral side and turn the patient after we had shoots at the knee and turn him on the belly and then go in from the back side. This is a two and a half hour surgery. So on the back side you see all the vessels and all the nerves. You have to clearly identify them to avoid injury of those very important structures. If you have a situation like that where the joint is destructive you see the cystic lesions on the outside of the knee, at the femur and at the tibia. There is no way you have to implant, uh, you have to do an arthroplasty. Else the patient won't be happy with his knee. So arthroplasty is in an extended disease a solution. Normally at the knee joint you have to remove the dorsal part when wait, say for three months, that's our philosophy. And then do the implantation of the arthroplasty and by the arthroplasty the removement of the PVS from the ventral part. You can't do it in, in one surgery because from the anterior side you are not able to remove all the tissue on the back side. You have to turn the patients, you have to do a second incision on the back and it's better to be done in two surgeries than in one surgery if you do an arthroplasty. This is a PVS of the hip uh, in a 49-year-old patient. Uh, this patient had pain and she was found to have a coxophritis. 
and you see that cystic lesion at the rim of the acetabulum and uh, all thought, yes, this is what we call a signal cyst at the acetabulum as a sign of a severe coxarthritis. But that was not a coxarthritis, that was a PVS, a diffuse PVS, and that was only clear after an MRI was done, where it was seen that the whole joint was in fact covered with the PVS. And this is a girl, 16 year old, and she had a localized, a nodular form of PVS, and that grew so slowly that the bone at the uh, at the hip, at the neck of the hip, was um, impressed by the lesion. And you see, if you see that with that sclerotic rim, you see it on the MRI and on the X-ray, you always know that there is something very slowly growing. And if you see the typical MRI inside that grayish tissue in the hip, you see dark island, dark islands. That is the typical aspect, as uh, said before, for a PVS. And you have to remove it and then the, the uh, patient is healed. Removing it at the hip is not too easy because uh, the hip is deep inside the body. You have either to do it arthroscopically, that means you have to shave that tumor out, but by shaving you might, you might wash in cells of a PVS in other regions of a joint and they might come back. So in general, the risk of recurrence after arthroscopic resections is higher than after open incisions and open resections. So in an open surgery, you just take out that, uh, that nodule. You see it has a, it has a very small um, linkage to the joint capsule and you just cut through that linkage and remove it in total. And then the risk of recurrence is nearly zero. Very, very difficult, those patients at the foot. You see that the lesion goes all around the joints. The foot has not only one joint, but several joints. And you see a lot of those joints are involved in the PVS. And if you have to resect it, you need more than one incision. And because the foot tends to swell after surgery, and um, you have to do a lot of surgery for that foot, we normally like to do uh, such uh, extended sinovectomies at the foot with two incisions at two surgeries. So do one, wait some weeks till all has recovered, and then do the second. And those extended lesions, as in those patients at the foot, have a very high risk of recurrence because you always have some of those PVS parts left in some cleft or in some cyst or whatever in the foot. And in those patients, we advise radiotherapy as an adjuvant therapy. Very, very rare. But if you have such a case, you should think to advise that to the patient. This is one of the easiest cases. You have a nodular lesion at the knee joint. You open the knee joint, take a scissor, cut it out. And for the patient, it's a unproblematic surgery. And the risk of recurrence, if you really cut it out um, without leaving anything behind, the risk of recurrence is nearly 0%. This is a lesion growing over a longer time, the patient said 12 months, but it must be longer, at the grade 2. And you see that the lesion has grown inside the, uh, the bone. It started, we think, most probably at the, uh, the, the joint of the grade 2, but it may be also start, or may have also started at the tendons, we don't know it. And when you see the, the yellow, green, brownish uh, lesion, and you see the cystic lesions in the bone, which had been created by that lesion which growed over several months, if not years. We have some patients where the PVS is an incidental finding. Uh, I have uh, told you that we have patients where the colleagues said uh, or thought that it was a meniscal tear and at the end it was a PVS. But we also have patients who have a destructive joint, get an arthroplasty, and by or it, it, during arthroplasty the surgeon say, oh, what's that? 
that doesn't look like those other 200 patients I treated this year. And uh, if he does venal histology, he may get the result of a PBS. And that is important because in a knee joint, for example, you may have a PBS also in the dorsal side. And then you have to do an MRI, have to look for that. And if you see masses of PBS, you have to resect it. In those or in this 57 year old patient, the PBS was diagnosed by the implantation or with the implantation of an unicondylar knee joint. And um, later on, the joint get, uh, got the total destruction because of ongoing PVS. It was not resected afterwards in total, and the patients needed a total knee joint. I think it was unavoidable. Um, even at the time of the unicondylar knee joint, the disease was so progressive that the total knee joint was unavo uh, unavoidable in, in this patient. After the, after the um, arthroplasty, you have to do follow-up. Follow-up is very important. In our patients, we operate or we do surgeries on PVS. We do a follow-up with an MRI every three months in the first year, every six months in the second, and then once a year till five years after surgery. You may argue that every three months is uh, too short. So every six months, I think, is also appropriate, but you have to do it on a regular pace, a basis if you like not to miss a recurrence of a PBS. A recurrence is very often. In a partial sinovectomy, you have approximately 50% recurrence. In a total sinovectomy, at least 10%. Uh, in unexperienced centers, the numbers are as high as 50% but at least 10% for example in our center. In the localized form you have a recurrence of nearly 0% because you resect all the tumor. We uh, did the thesis by one of our students, uh, Mr. Capel, and he investigated 105 patients who had 122 surgeries. So a lot of those patients had more than one surgery. So you see it in the line below. And if we had a primary lesion that means that the disease was diagnosed and when the patient came to us or we diagnosed it, we had the recurrence rate of 11%. And in the recurrent lesions, patients who already had uh, resections elsewhere and then had a recurrent disease and came in, we have one third of the patients with a recurrent disease after our surgery. So in total of uh, 120 surgeries, we have 18% recurrences, but those patients had then a second or a third or a fourth surgery. We had one patient who had five surgeries. And at the end, 95% of our patients at the last follow-up uh, had no recurrent disease. The involved joints are as typical, the knee joint, and then ankle, foot, hand, hip, elbow, and uh, all other regions you can imagine. And this is our distribution of age, and you see the two peaks. One between 20 and 30 years, and one around 50 years. And we think that there's a two-peak disease in the younger age and in the older age. And this is a couple of Maya curve of our local recurrence. You see two things. On the first side, you see that we have about 18% recurrences on the long term after 10 years. And on the other side, on the very front side, on the left side of the curve, you see that the recurrences all happen, nearly all happen, despite two patients, in the first three years of sur after surgery. And uh, not, uh, this is linear, that means in the first year not most of them, but in the first year one third, in the second year one third, and in the third year one third. So after three years, we nearly have no recurrences, and in the first three years, they come on a linear basis. And you see the difference, if you see the diffuse and the nodular form, we have very, very less recurrences in the nodular form, typically after resection elsewhere, where this was an incidental finding and the colleagues did not resect all of the tumor because they didn't like to do an open surgery, um, by not knowing what we really have uh, uh, for histology. So we waited the histology, then sent the patients 
and when he came in and we did the vent the total resection. So our resection rate even in the nodular lesions is not nearly a percent, it's 10 percent, but that is a fact of some patients who had not a total resection as first therapy. And in the diffuse form you see 30 percent of recurrent disease, now nearly 30 percent. The primary lesions are very much better than the recurrent lesion. So if a lesion recurs, when the probability of a second recurrence is much higher after surgery than uh, if you have a patient with a primary disease. And as uh, uh, you have seen before, the first three years are the important years and in the first three years it's going linear down. So the first three years have to be um, done with a very careful follow-up. Molecular markers and aggressiveness of disease are, as you have seen before, not correlated. So there is at the moment no molecular marker which you can identify in pathology and then tell the patient, oh you have it, then you have a better or a worse prognosis. There is no marker at all, so you have really to know if whether it's a diffuse or nodular form, a primary or a recurrent, and then you have to do a follow-up of the patients according to that clinical risk factors. In nodular PVS, surgery is nearly the only thing what you can do, or you can do a lot of things, but surgery is really the best thing what you can do. And the three-year uh, survival, local recurrence free survival in that study was 88%. And this is uh, this uh, had been a study collecting more than 900 patients, also our own patients we had sent in. And um, you see that the local risk of recurrence did not considerably decrease after three years. So even after 10 years, 80% uh, of the patients stayed free of disease. In a diffuse form, uh, the game has changed. So in a diffuse form you have a recurrence free survival after um, three years or after five years of 55% and after 10 years of 40%. That means in the diffuse form in that large collection of patients half of the patients recured. And this is not because the colleagues are unexperienced with surgery in many cases, the surgeries in PBS are, or the patients with PBS are treated in centers with only a single digit number of patients per year. And in those patients, you might, you might underestimate the risk of a patient having recurrence and then do the surgery not aggressive enough. So this is resampled by a recurrence rate of 60% after 10 years. And um, we always advise to do the resection open, not atherosclopically, because we think that the security by doing it in an open fashion is higher than in an atherosclopic fashion. This has disadvantages. The patient needs more time for recovery. He has a larger scar. But we think the advantage is worth to do it in an open manner. And you see our recurrence rate again in primary lesion 11% and also in the worst cases the recurrent ones who had then her second, third or fourth surgery in our department, 34% long time recurrence and this is really a good number in that disease. What can you do else despite surgery? You can do radiosinophiotesis. What is that? This is a method developed in the last century by the colleagues from nuclear medicine. Very often used, it's a very common method all over the world, very often used in former years in rheumatic disease. Till the medication in rheumatic disease changed dramatically, the medical therapy, and uh, nowadays radiosinophiotesis is rarely done in rheumatic disease, but the method is now transferred also to PBS. You inject into a joint uh, a radioactive material. This is uh, normally it's uh, sending beta rays. Beta rays have um, a radiation which goes for about one to two millimeters of tissue. 
So by injecting it into the joint, it won't radiate outside the body, it keeps into the joint. But it, because it's going only one or two millimeters into the tissue, uh, you cannot treat a conventional PVS just by injection of that medication. Because in a normal PVS, the tissue of the PVS is much thicker, of much thicker layer than one or two millimeters. So the indication for radiosynoviotesis is not treating PVS in a, uh, as, an, as an alternative to surgery, but using it after surgery. If the surgeon says, I'm sure I have all of the PVS resected, but maybe in one or the other cleft there is uh, another cell, then you may do a PVS as an adjuvant measure, an, an adjuvant method to reduce or yeah, hopefully to reduce the number of recurrences. And the literature in the starting 2000 says it works. But if you go further on, there are just small studies. This study was published in uh, 2018 and the colleagues say there, doesn't, there is no benefit from radiosynoviotesis. So we had been not sure what we should advocate to our own patients and we had a close look at our own numbers. What had we done? Out of our patients, we took a reverse group, those with a diffuse PVS. And we took only one joint, a knee joint, because normally for radiosynoviotesis you need a closed compartment. You can't do it at the foot or at the hand, you have no closed space where you can inject that radioactive medication. If you wait six weeks after, after synovectomy at the knee, a new capsule has formed and you can easily inject your medication and it will stay into the joint and not go in other parts of the body. And so we choose the knee joint, a very homogeneous population of patients. And we had 26 patients who had a radiosynoviotesis and 37 who had just surgery. And both had the same number of recurrence. So I said, okay, very clear, RSO doesn't change the game. The results after RSO and surgery are the same as just after surgery alone. And I go, or I, with that message, I uh, did go to our nuclear medicines, uh, Professor Tillman, and said to him, oh, we don't have to advocate RSO further on because it doesn't make any sense to the patient, no benefit. And when he said, oh, be careful, those patients, this was not a randomized study, so those patients who had a radiosynoviotesis had been the, versus, the most worst patients. They have the most aggressive disease and the surgeons later said, we want something more than just surgery. The other ones who had no radiosynoviotesis had been the standard risk patients. And at the end, we have the same rate of recurrence in the highest risk patients compared to the standard risk patients with RSO or with the treatment of radiosynoviotesis. So this explanation might be true or not. I don't know it. But at the moment, we in Munich advocate radiosynoviotesis in those cases where we have the impression that the risk of recurrence is very high and we want uh, some more adjuvant therapy. We say it's uh, uh, the belt and uh, uh, trousers principle of uh, therapy, so we want both. And um, the disadvantages of radiosynoviotesis are not very high, you can repeat it. So we advocate it, but we are not sure whether it really gives a benefit to a patient. Then we have the external PIM radiation. That is a standard radiation. We use, or the colleagues of radiotherapy, use normally lower doses as they would use it in cancer patients or in sarcoma patients. So typical dosage would be 20 to 30 gray. And with external PIM radiation, you can control the disease. The problem is that many of those patients are very young and you don't know what happened with radiotherapy 
after 30, 40, 50 years of time. So you may have a second malignancy in the field of radiotherapy, for example. And also radiotherapy to joints or to a foot does a lot of harm. It causes scars, it causes uh, loss of motion. And so um, you have really be careful with the indication of radiotherapy. It helps, but it has disadvantages. So over the thumb, I would say we have three patients with which had radio or who had radiotherapy because we could not easily resect the lesion or we had been sure that the lesion would recure. For example, at the foot I showed you the patient before. This is another patient. He had uh, a large disease of PVS going inside the bone of his uh, upper arm, going inside his scapula, destructing his shoulder, going inside all of the muscles and all of the soft tissues around the shoulder. And we did uh, two surgeries and hadn't been able to remove all of that lesion because it's all over his shoulder. And so we decided to go for a radiotherapy and he stayed stable for now 11 years and is happy with no loss of motion or no little bit loss of motion of course but no further loss of motion as he had before. This is the problem. You may, you may resect all that. As an orthopedic oncologist it's uh, your daily work to resect malignant tumors in, with a clear margin. But if you do that in this PBS patient, he will lose his shoulder and his motion of the shoulder. And it's a benign disease. He won't die of that disease as a cancer patient. So this is not an adequate solution for the patient to have a large tumor resection of the shoulder. And we opted for that case for radiotherapy in addition to surgery. If you have a destruction of a joint, for example, the knee joint, and you need an arthroplasty, many patients with PVS at the knee joint later need arthroplasties. Their results are not as good as the results in normal osteoarthritis because all those joints had been treated before. They had one or the other surgery before, they had radiosinophytosis, they had uh, all kinds of uh, yeah, adjuvant therapies you can imagine before they decide to go into an arthroplasty. And for that the risk of an arthroplasty as infection or as uh, less sufficient motion is much higher, twice as high than in a normal patient with osteoarthritis. That has to be told to the patient. Last point, systemic therapies. I have uh, shown you before that there are some molecular changes inside the tumor. For example, uh, those uh, uh, CSF1 receptor, which is nearly seen in all patients with a diffuse PVS. And we have this receptor also in some sarcoma or cancer diseases. And for that, already drugs, antibody drugs, had been developed. And so, it was very interesting to test those drugs on patients with a PVS. For example, in that study, they tested imacutuzumab. Uh, you see a lot of drugs with VIAP or VIP at the end. Those are all antibody-based drugs. And um, we saw that some of the patients had um, at least to some extent um, regression of their disease. Many of them stayed stable. And this is a big problem. So if you have uh, an antibody or if you have any form of drug which is uh, developed for cancer therapy, you expect that the patients who will have a benefit from that drug will have a better prognosis in the regions of months, for example. So say the uh, placebo group will have uh, no local recurrence in six months and the treatment group will have a local recurrence after six months in malignant disease. But in PBS you have a disease which is very, very, very slowly growing over years. And if you do 
the same study using a drug from cancer therapy and when you have a look at six months or even after a year, you won't see big differences in many cases. And we call that when stable disease. And stable disease in cases of cancer patients is a big benefit. So it's, a, it's in favor of a drug to have a stable disease. But in PVS, a stable disease in 6 or 12 months is just what you also expect in a placebo group or what you expect in a placebo group. So that very first study in that drug was not very overwhelming. But you see it here, we had a complete remission in 4% of a patient's stable disease in 65% and the partial response in 27%. And you have some not wanted uh, drug uh, effects uh, which uh, may cause a lot of problems to the patients. We used then imatinib. Imatinib is a classical drug for oncology treatment. And also imatinib had some effect on PVS, but only some. Many of the patients discontinued imatinib because of uh, yeah, unwanted reactions. And um, so at the end of the day, imatinib was called not very effective in PVS. That was at the time point where another substance was introduced. To give you an example of imatinib, this is a patient, 1965 born, which had the diagnosed um, PVS in 2014. You see at that point, 2014, the young patient had uh, a large, a very large diffuse disease of the left hip. And five years later, with no therapy, five years later, it was nearly the same. So it was a stable disease over five years with no therapy. But her pain increased and so some, something has to be done and the colleagues who treated her decided to go for imatinib. And they used imatinib for three months and in three months you see nothing. You see no change between left and right. But the patient had a lot of discomfort due to the drug and so he or she uh, stopped the drug and came to us and when we did the implantation of uh, uh, an arthroplasty, of a hip arthroplasty. This situation at the hip is difficult because at the hip in a diffuse form you have a disease in front, in the back, uh, upper, lower hip and you always have typically one incision and with one incision at the hip you are not able to go through all out the joint and sometimes you have to say dislocate the hip and that might cause severe damage to the hip. And we don't do it really in a benign disease. We are not very happy to do it. Um, so at the hip treatment is very complicated. But if the hip is destructed, as in that female patient, it's very easy. Because when you can open the joint, when you can resect the, the head of the hip who is already destructed, when you have a good view into the joint and can do all the silo. After imatinib, uh, a substance called nilutinib was introduced, or it was on the market for other diseases, and it was tested for PBS, and it has also some effect. Um, it was tested for 12 weeks. 12 weeks is, as you know, nearly nothing for PBS, but at least, you see it on the numbers here, um, a lot of the patients had the treatment-related adverse effect. Um, the effect on the disease was not very good. So the colleagues decided to go not further with that substance. And the last substance introduced was dexitaptilinib. And this was investigated in a very good study. On 120 patients, uh, double-blinded, that means not only the patient, and uh, uh, also the doctors did not know which patient got which drug. So the results are really, uh, really good, or you can compare it. And if you see it, you see that uh, quite a lot of those patients, a third, had a response, that means had a regression of the disease in the treated group, and no one in the placebo group. And you have stable disease in both groups about the same. But you have a third of the patients, a third to 40% of the patients who really improve with the drug.
the disadvantage was that um, a lot of patients had also unwanted toxicity, especially hepatotoxicity on the liver. And that caused a number of doctors in the disease that is benign to be uh, very, very, uh, not very aggressive with that substance, but to keep it just for cases where no other therapy does work. Because the unwanted uh, toxicity has been a problem. So in conclusion, and that is my last slide, the etiology of PBS remains unclear. The best option for therapy is surgery. You can do a radiosynoviotesis with some advantages and disadvantages. It's unclear at the moment for those patients that radiosynoviotesis might really have a benefit. Not, definitely not in patients who have an active disease. You can do a radiotherapy. It has a very satisfactory results, but on the long run some disadvantages. And you can do an antibody therapy especially if the surgery in those patients will have a severe morbidity for the patients or functional loss of the patient's uh, extremities. So you might consider then uh, systemic therapy as an option. We don't know what happens after you stop the medication. We think at the moment that the disease will recure. So you are in, in a situation that is not very happy for the patients. He takes in a drug which might in 40% of the cases really help him. In a, quite a high number of patients he will develop liver toxicity and after cessation no one knows whether the disease will come back, we expect that, or will stay in a regression for how long, no one knows. So thank you very much for your attention. I put some of the papers uh, on our homepage. Uh, if you have further interest, just have a look at the homepage. And we are happy that we had you with us. Thank you very much.